Almost 200 years ago, Stevenson's locomotion number one hauled 450 passengers from Darlington to Stockton. That 1825 train trip changed the world and how we travel. Here at Brusselton, near West Auckland, County Durham, we can see the remains of the mineral goods line that fed into the main passenger run at Darlington. Stevenson laid the rails on stout stone pillars embedded into the ground instead of the lateral sleepers of later tracks. The original Georgian bridge still stands today, but engineers have diverted the road to a wider cut through the abandoned embankment. This is the first of a network of lines that spread across the globe. It all began here. Things have improved since those early days, but is the railway now out of control, careering towards destruction? The crumbling edge of quality was a phrase coined by Sir Peter Parker in the late 1970s. He was the British Railway's board chairman, trying to alert us all to the lack of spending on the railway's ageing infrastructure. There were temporary speed restrictions, poor services and relentless cuts. Some routes were reduced to a single track. Uncontrolled inflation drove up costs, fares increased, ridership was in decline. Parker's warnings led to reforms that put the railway back on track, paving the way for John Major's privatisation in 1993. The government gave away British Railways, formed in 1948, to over 100 smaller concerns whose only aim was profit. Five decades later, following much expense on infrastructure and rolling stock, Britain's railways are again facing uncertainty. Cost cuts and over-ambitious carbon targets are now having an impact on quality. COVID-19 wrecked the privatisation financial model. Although the number of passengers is now near the pre-pandemic level, commuter and business use remains depressed, meaning income is falling short of expectations. Today, revenue from tickets and freight vanishes into the government's coffers. However, the money to run the system is drip-fed by the parsimonious Department for Transport, which issued emergency contracts to replace the previous train operator franchises. This split means that the railways cannot be run like any other business. Contractors are reluctant to spend on things that increase efficiency or revenue, as they will not reap any benefit. Earlier this year, Minister of Transport Mark Harper highlighted this madness. He said that the income and expenditure should be matched up. However, others in the government are happy for the railways to be an unencumbered income stream from a strangled cost base. Flashing spending and services has become the order of the day. 
Inflation of around 10% per year, combined with a series of industrial disputes over pay and working practices, have caused disruption to services across the country. The government seems unwilling to do anything to combat these destructive influences threatening our once great railway system. Much has been made of the Prime Minister's peremptory cancellation of high-speed rail, but beneath the surface, network rail has seen an increase in earthworks failures. Other vital infrastructure repairs are needed. In contrast, the government says that whilst there is an urgent need for continuing modernization, companies must implement significant efficiency savings to reduce the cost of the railways. The master plan calls for an arm's length quango, great British railways, to oversee a balance between infrastructure and operations. In the words of the ever-optimistic Harper, its aim will be to deliver an efficient and high-performing railway split into five regions run by industry experts. Great British Railways will be a coordinating body, not a decision-making one. Meanwhile, the cost-cutting continues, with the government ordering train operators to scrap whole fleets of serviceable roaming stock. This has resulted in shorter, less frequent trains, further reducing ridership and revenue. The government has frozen the rail sector support subsidies, thus delivering an instant 10% reduction for operators thanks to inflation. Further reductions in government railway support are inevitable. When Great British Railways does develop ahead of steam, it will face indomitable challenges. It's almost as if the Tories wanted to fail. Avanti West Coast's parent, Trenitalia, wants to spend money on Britain's railways, like its recent expansion in Spain. However, it needs the government to relax its grip on the industry. The next train to arrive at Platform 4 will be the 1249 Avanti West Coast service to London Euston, calling it Penrith for the North Lakes, Lancaster, Preston, Wigan Northwestern, Warrington Bank Quay, and London Euston. This train is formed of 11 coaches. You can find the shop in Coach C for delicious hot and cold refreshments. First class coaches can be found at the front of the train in zones 1 to 4. Standard coaches are at the rear of the train in zones 5 to 10. Unreserved seating can be found in coaches C, U and G. The West Coast contract has been extended twice, despite Avanti and First Group's many failures to maintain the service. The joint venture has promised to improve things by recruiting more drivers, leading to fewer cancellations. This fond desire may have hit the terminal buffers, as Trenitalia was a partner in the now cancelled High Speed 2 project. We could go with the rising stars of free enterprise, like Chanitalia, willing to balance income and expenditure in an attempt at customer satisfaction, hoping that they do not implode like tulips or the South Sea bubble. The alternatives are state control, as in British Railways, where revenue is used on the network, not dispersed to a diaspora of shareholders 
or, as is more probable, the dismal, grey, half-hearted, halfway house of failure as proposed by our lacklustre government. Watch some more from Radio Jonathan. Subscribe to the channel. Enjoy.